Okay, I think I'm doing it. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, so uh, another thing that um, was really useful that we did in our second year was ask for a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement in the applications. Um, DEI principles are really uh, something we highly, highly value as workshop organizers. However, kind of trying to gauge people's um, knowledge of and engagement and investment in DEI issues just from their CVs and um, what they um, kind of uh, mention in the applications if you're not explicitly asking for it really isn't feasible. And so asking directly about these things makes it a whole lot easier to, um, to take those into account and really value them the way that we should. Um, another thing that kind of came catalyzed from our first year was uh, we had some applicants who we weren't able to admit to the workshop reach out and ask for kind of constructive feedback about their applications and kind of try to understand the, the process that we use to um, make our admissions decisions. Um, and so in our second year, we decided to organize our, our review process so that all of our criteria and rankings and comments were um, organized and then sent back to all the applicants. Uh, we felt that if the applicants were um, taking all this effort to uh, apply to our workshop, the least that we could do is kind of make it as constructive as an experience for them, even if we weren't able to admit them to the workshop, um, to be able to give them um, some insight into how we read their application and um, some constructive feedback on it. Um, and something I want to continue to improve on um, with the workshop is reaching outside of our uh, own networks to solicit applications. This is kind of a really tricky problem because, you know, um, your, your own professional networks tend to kind of, um, you know, be similar to you in a lot of ways and um, really striving to systematically reach outside of those networks um, to recruit, I think, is really crucial to getting a diverse applicant pool. Um, and I think it's it's something that we definitely need to continue to, to work on um, at the workshop here. In terms of workshop organization, um, I had a few things on this slide, uh, but I cut it down for time. But kind of the, the main thing that surprised me um, in the first year uh, was um, kind of the, 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 the pay logistics issues that came up with in terms of getting everybody their stipends and making sure that was happening in a timely manner. Um, and the, the thing I was most surprised about was that um, uh, how long participants were kind of willing to give the benefit of the doubt to the system if it wasn't working and they weren't getting paid. Um, and, and that uh, I found much better success this year, kind of establishing an expectation that participants would reach out as soon as there was any issues so that we could rectify it uh, uh, much more quickly. Um, kind of another really big change from the, the first year um, that I think was kind of our, our, one of our most successful changes was um, about how we approached remote team building and socializing. I think this is one of the, the most important parts of um, having kind of a workshop environment, being able to have a community um, where uh, participants can develop professional and personal connections with one another and kind of lean on each other for support and um, get a lot of out of their, their interactions with each other. Um, and it's something that's really difficult in a virtual environment. Um, and so our first year, we tried doing like a separate after hours event, um, like having a weekly drop in social time where we would play games and stuff. Um, and over several weeks of advertising this and um, trying trying to get get people to show up, we had exactly zero workshop participants ever show up for this. Um, even though the you know we'd have a few mentors show up and, and hang out and um, opine about how we couldn't get any participants to come um, show up to this. Um, and we had much better success this year with integrating kind of the social and team building aspect in, into the curriculum itself. So we restructured our enrichment, um, uh, our, our enrichment meetings so that the first half hour of the enrichment meeting was actually kind of social time and team building time where we would do act, um, kind of virtual activities where we could chat and do something more informal and fun. Um, and 
I did a lot of kind of digging to try to find stuff that would work well in the virtual um, environment. Some stuff, some activities we'd had didn't so much, some did. And so I'll just kind of really briefly share some of the stuff that I found worked really well for like a 20 minute team building activity. GeoGuessr is great. It's like a little web app that um, drops you into Google Street View somewhere in the world. You have to guess where you are. And we broke our participants up into teams and had them compete to so see you could figure out um, where they were the best. Um, categories was really fun in a virtual setting. Um, the key here was to pick categories that are fun and open-ended and kind of related to your, uh, your, your workshop. Um, we had lots of fun uh, with the category of bad code comments. There were really some bad code comments that people came up with. Wikipedia races was another one that was fun. We had a start and a stop Wikipedia page and then broke the participants into teams to try to get them to um, uh, find the shortest route between two Wikipedia pages by clicking links. Um, and just a random question generator was another one that we had a lot of fun with um, that I thought worked really well as an icebreaker, um, getting everybody talking, going around and um, having it spit out a random question for everyone. Hat tip again to Acacia for coming up with a pets and plants Slack channel um, that we had at the workshop this summer where people could share pictures of their um, beloved animals and um, plants. Uh, that was really wholesome and made me really happy. And I thought that was, that was a, um, really fun and a great idea. Um, and we definitely want to improve on making Slack kind of more of a go-to resource for peer-to-peer -peer questions and chit chat. And if people have kind of ideas about how to do that, I'd love to hear them. Um, just to conclude here, um, uh, kind of one of my biggest takeaways was that doing workshop activities really is something that you kind of feasibly can do by the seat of your pants. And even if you're in a situation where you're hiring an army of summer assistants or up and down the, the hallway, as it were, people are hiring summer assistants, kind of pooling effort on enrichment and um, onboarding activities to get people up with, to speed with the technical knowledge they need can really pay off. And I'd really recommend kind of um, uh, um, taking advantage of that and um, uh, bringing, bringing especially people together over the summer is, always pays off really well. So wondering how we can do this again next year, stay tuned for that. And a huge thank you to the mentors and participants. Um, you make my job, uh, it's sometimes it's challenging, but it's always really rewarding and enjoyable. So thank you. Um, the, big thanks to the two PIs um, that make this possible and our wonderful participants from last year and this year. Um, acknowledge our funding and it uh, looks like we are right at time so probably no time for questions but I will hand the mic over to Charles. So Matthew either you're going to want to make me host again or you'll need to promote both Charles and Kate to being co-hosts. Let me let me see if I can make you host one second. Uh, Mike more make host yes. I, did I fix it? I think your host. I now have the power. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Okay, I'm going to stop my video and so, hand the floor over. So, so oh, while, you're in, while you're in that transition, though, I won't do a, a mm -hmm. question, but I will just make a comment, which is mostly just a thank you, Matthew, for, uh, I mean, you've sort of summarized lessons learned since on, but really, you were the one to organize this from start to finish. And so well done. I mean, this has just been amazing. Your second year, even better than the first. So uh, uh, you're pretty humble in the way you've done this, but but kudos for all, all your good work on this. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Oh, that, that's really nice to hear. OK, so it looks like I can share screen now. So that's good. Um, and I also want to say, um, yeah, as, as one additional thank you to Matthew before I begin this, Matthew made most of the talk I'm about to give. I'm I'm just you know going through the sli <laughs> the slides. So did Emily. Emily made parts of it, but Matthew made you know the the, the majority of it. Um, so what I'm going to talk a little bit about now is the empirical library, and empirical is the foundation for. Uh, so many of the different projects that we work on in, in both my lab and in, in the WAVES workshop. Uh, and our goal here with Empirical is to build a scientific software library for research, education, and public engagement, right? So that it's really easy to build all of these sorts of things. And we really have um, four main objectives um, for the software that we want 
to come out of this library, right? The library is to make it easy to build software, and um, we want to make it easy to build software that is very available. So we provide all sorts of web components to allow developers to build uh, different different kinds of uh, interactive web interfaces where you can still use C++, which is a favorite for scientific software because of its efficiency and other reasons, but um, you know, uh, uh, you know, you, you don't need to have a deep understanding of web development in order to take your C++ software get, and get it running on the web. Um, we also want it to be very reliable. We stress test all of the tools with the, uh, within Empirical to get them to, um, uh, to, you know, to, so, to make sure that uh, that they are they are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing right and correctly and that we've tried to explore the edge cases and in fact we have a very thorough testing suite um, where anytime anyone makes a change to the software the, the entire testing suite is automatically run when that change is committed uh, to make sure that nothing breaks etc and the toll testing suite has to pass before new changes can be committed into the main branch um, obviously, utility is always a key thing where we want to have tools throughout um, uh, Empirical that are just going to be useful for you, like the, the common sorts of things that you need to use when building uh, scientific software. Um, you know, so things like you're going to need to configure your software, you're going to need to manage data, you're going to need to generate random numbers, you need to do all sorts of mathematical manipulations. And in particular, um, we're obviously in, in Beacon and in my research group very interested in, in evolution, and so we have a lot of tools there that are specifically for evolution related things. Um, and as all of, all of and I shouldn't say all of it, as, as anyone who's worked in the Waves workshop knows that one of, the, one of the big layers on top of Empirical is MABE, which I'll mention more later, which is really focused on, on uh, evolving populations. And of course, efficiency is, um, is, is going to be key with all of this because whenever you're building scientific software, it needs to go fast. That's the whole reason that we're doing all this in C++ is to make sure that the final software can go as fast as possible because when you're when a run that you're doing is going to take you know uh, uh, three days you don't want to code something wrong and make it take three weeks instead that's really painful if it was going to take three seconds and oh look it takes three minutes well if, if it's only something you have to run once it's not so bad um and if it's if it's if it was going to take three milliseconds and said it takes 300 milliseconds well then that's probably fine in most cases but for scientific software it's usually one of these things that takes a long time to run, so efficiency is critical. I'm going to talk a little bit more about availability and utility here. So the main vision for um, uh, availability is that when, when we have science, when you think of scientific software, when most people think of scientific software at least, and they think about running it themselves, they picture having to download all sorts of stuff and struggle with getting it to work on their computer. And this is something that any of us who have tried to grab scientific packages and use them have probably gone through because it takes, you know, particularly if you have to compile it yourself, I normally expect it's going to take many hours before I have something actually up and running. But if you want lots of people to use it, if you want it to be as available, you want them to be able to click a button and for have, have it just work. And so to have it just, just work means that we want it to be uh, in a web browser um, and we want it to, uh, uh, to be that you don't have to download an extra plugin or anything like that for your web browser, that it just should work in any, uh, any web browser as easily as possible. So how do we do this? Um, well, we, oops, sorry, I went, jumped too quickly. We um, write, you can write the interface using Empirical, um, which will then compile to JavaScript um, and actually now we're, we're shifting a lot of it into compiling into WebAssembly with MScript in. So JavaScript and WebAssembly are the only things that will run automatically on all web browsers. And um, using MScript in allows us to take C++ and do this conversion. And MScript in is incredibly high efficiency. So in converting to JavaScript, it makes the things run somewhere between half and two thirds the speed of native. 
which is incredible, right? For that, for a web browser to be running as quickly as if you had downloaded something. And in the move to WebAssembly, things are getting up more, closer to like 80% of the speed of native, which, you know, is obviously amazing. Then, um, you know, you, we have the, the C++ that is now a web app that can run as a web app. But of course, you still need some kind of interface and we need that interface to be as simple as possible. So we tried to build this um, in a really straightforward fashion. So here's a simple C++ program that, that uses um, uh, um, uh, em empirical. And so it has to, um, when you compile it, you need to make sure to uh, in include in the um, empirical directory, but everything in there is header files. So you don't need to do anything special. Um, you, um, you just pound include uh, um, web.h, you can then create a doc, right? Which is a it's it's of type empirical web document, but this is just literally your web page document. So if any any of you do use JavaScript or, or HTML, you you work with a document in the web page. From there, you can manipulate. Whoops, ah, you can manipulate this doc object in all sorts of ways. You can set whatever attributes you want on it. So if you've used HTML, you can know all these different attributes. But really, you you um, we're gonna we're gonna use the attribute here, jumbotron. So just to you know, just to make something big and interesting, um, you then send anything into that document, like just like you would stream uh, any other message in C plus plus. Use the less than less than, and you can send things in to say, hey, I want this font to be you know. Um, size 100 and purple and I want it to then you stream in after that hello browser and so it should print hello browser and then we're also going to say hey if you if you print something like the way you normally do in C++ to see out hello console that that should go in the web console and I'll show you show you what that does in a minute you need a boilerplate html file with it you don't even have to know what any of this is in the html file um, but uh, mostly it uses jQuery um, you know, in order to make everything work. And then whatever you compile this to, you just have to have that name. In this case, we're calling this this C++ hello.js. So we're compiling it to. And so we just tell it to use that. And in this case, we're also using bootstrap. So what happened? And so, but this, this file, the HTML file, you basically plug in. It's only the C++ file that you're going to need to uh, really modify. And that does a jumbotron that says hello browser, right? Okay. So that's that's the availability vision for the utility vision. Um, we really want to have just this holistic framework for all sorts of, of science, but with digital evolution being our original um, uh, purpose behind it, and MABE two being our most recent big purpose behind it, where we want to we want to take the original version of MABE which is the modular agent-based evolver where you can plug all these things in to build whatever kind of artificial life or evolutionary computation system you want. We want to make it so you can plug all these in and have it work just like MAB1, only it's on the web, right? And so, um, so there's, the, there's all the utility of all these components that can plug together and the, the website availability. Within, um, uh, within empirical, um, we have lots and lots of different tools. And I listed a bunch of them before, but some of them are things like we have data tools where you can have a data node where you feed um, or you, you tell it about what data you want to track. And it can even pull the data for you. Every time you run it, it'll just go grab the data you need and, and do whatever calculations you want on it or statistics. It can track data over time. It can do all of this work for you where you no longer need to, to worry about it. And then you can take these data nodes and plug them into a visualizer and it will visualize them all for you, right? And so these are tools that are, uh, are, are very useful. So, so data analysis is used in any form of, of scientific uh, software. Um, we also have lots of digital evolution specific tools like this, you know, like we have phylogeny trackers so that every time an organism is born, we track exactly where that organism came from. So these are some great tools that, that Emily Dolson put together that it just makes it incredibly easy to, to track everything, to find a line of descent. So if you pick a final evolved organism, you want to see where it came from, it can track everything along the way. So in short, um, 
we really, you know, we're, we're really proponents of open science. We want to get people out there um, being able to use scientific software. When, when labs build scientific software, we want lots of other labs to be able to try out that software, make sure it does what they think it's doing, replicate experiments easy, easily. And, um, and I think empirical helps with that. It also helps just in general for scientific communication and outreach. Um, programs like MABE2 are, are in very specific application domains that are making things like digital evolution uh, software just much simpler and easier to use. Um, all of this is supposed to have a low barrier to entry, so it's all open source. We're using the MIT license, means, means anyone can use our source code. It's all header only, so you just pound include the files you need and they just work. Um, and we're always happy to help people get started for, for others who are interested in using this. And um, as these pieces get more and more developed, we're, we're, writing, we're writing papers to describe them and we really want in the future to get much more use uh, out of it. And so um, for all the stuff put together in, in this presentation, obviously I gave the presentation, but Matthew put most of it together and Emily put important pieces of it together. So thank both of you um, uh, for, for all of this. And both of them are heavily involved in all of the development I, I talked about. Um, lots of other people in Devo Lab ha have been involved in making all of this possible. Um, and you know, in, in other projects like Avita and Avita Ed and all of that. Um, and of course, um, for the past two years, so Wave, uh, Waves uh, 2020 and uh, Waves, whoops, oh, do we not get the Waves 2021 picture in? Oh no. <laughs> uh, and of course, Waves this year, but you already saw that picture. Um, you, you guys have done uh, a huge amount to, to make all of, all of this possible. And, um, and uh, again, another th uh, thanks to uh, Rob Pennick, who's the lead PI on the grant that is supporting most of the WAVES project that is making all of this happen. And with that, I think I finished one minute early, so maybe I can take one question. <laughs> So it looks like Jay, you have a question. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great presentation. Um, I'm gonna probably ask you guys about this uh, like more one-on-one, -on -one, but just for other people here, how, how do we get started? So you guys would love to help us get started. What does that process look like? Right. So um, it depends on what aspects you're, you're you're talking about, right? There's so there's different on ramps to the different parts of it. So for empirical. Um, if you're if you're developing C++ code, um, we would show you where, where to download it, how to include pieces of empirical in, and just generally what's there to be used, right? So 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 that's sort of the piece that's furthest along. MABE two is is next furthest along, and the real goal with MABE two is to make it so you can you can have all these components to plug together to build your own bespoke digital evolution software as needed. Um, that um, that development is coming along really well. It, it that's still at a point where um, pe for people to get involved, we would need. Um, you know, we're not need, we, we, it would be more on the programming level. My guess is in the next month or two, it'll be a lot easier for people to get involved at the um, um, at the just simply user level because it's it's really uh, it's really getting pretty close. Um, and then um, you know, for, for Avita and Avita Ed, obviously older versions are out there, but we're. Uh, as MABE2 gets, um, um, gets further along, we're, we're building all sorts of specific components for Avita and for Avita Ed to get all of that out there, but that's still you know, even slightly earlier on than, than the other parts. All right, I should. It looks like people have also been throwing some links in the Slack. Or, or sorry, not in the Slack, in the chat, the Zoom chat. I'm all scrambled. Um, all right, thank you for the, pr the presentation and for the questions. Um, we should move to our next presenter, who I believe is Abby. Um, if you want to take over, um, I'll hand the floor over to you. Absolutely, thank you. Let me share my screen. All right, oh no, I can't. <laughs> All right, uh, welcome to my systematics normalization presentation. Um, today, I'm gonna be specifically talking about a randomization-based approach to normalizing phylogeny metrics for digital evolution. 
Uh, my name is Abigail Wilson, and I am a junior at Bard College studying chemistry and computer science. And I've been working on this project for the past two summers with my mentor, Dr. Emily Dolson, who's a professor at MSU. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to thank Waves, Beacon, MSU, and ICER for their contributions to this project. So uh, for those who aren't, are, I'm sure most of you are familiar, but for those who aren't, uh, the basics of phylogenetic trees are that they represent evolutionary relationships between taxa, the tips of the trees represent descendant taxa, and the nodes are representative of common ancestors between those descendants. So the thing that I'm going to be talking about today specifically is the issue of phylogeny age and comparing phylogeny metrics across trees of different ages. So many of the metrics that we use to describe natural phylogenies are sensitive to the age of a tree or the number of generations that, that tree has been alive for. In nature, we make a lot of assumptions about phylogenies that aren't necessarily applicable in digital evolution. So I've shown a picture here of what's often referred to as the tree of life. And it sort of shows how all of life and evolution is interconnected and forms at one singular time point in the center. So with this approach and with this theory, you can kind of assume that even all of these subsections of this big tree are about the same age that come from the same time point. But when we're talking about digital evolution, that's not necessarily true. We're modeling popula populations that don't necessarily exist in nature. And therefore, a lot of the assumptions we make about phylogenies and how we measure them are not applicable in the context of digital evolution. So today, we're going to talk about how Emily and I have worked on trying to minimize that issue and work on creating metrics that are comparable across different size trees. So the metric that we've worked on the most is phylogenetic diversity. This is a measure of biodiversity in a population and is defined as the number of ancestor taxa plus the number of active taxa in a phylogeny minus one. This is one of the metrics that is affected by tree age and it becomes larger as the tree gets older. So if we look at the two trees here that I have on this slide, the top one, if we, we assume that the top one is older and that the bottom one is younger, we could assign um, a theoretical phylogenetic diversity value to either one. So the top one could be 20 and the bottom one could be three. And we can't really compare those values because the trees are differently aged. That, that number doesn't really mean anything in the context of having two differently sized trees. Because the bottom one, as it gets older, might actually end up with a phylogenetic diversity value that's higher than the tree above. So there's not really meaningful information you can draw from those two metrics alone. So what we're trying to do here is say, the bottom one, as opposed to all of the different possible like routes that it could have taken, how could it have diversified over time? Where does it stand right now? What in what percentile of is that diversity level? So that's what we're trying to do, which is normalization by percentile, which is the way that we've chosen to try and normalize this data. Uh, this is a pretty common idea. You see it, you know, in the SAT and in lots of different areas, which is taking this data and making it into uh, a percentile range, basically. So you have that, you know, your middle values, and then you have your tail ends. Uh, and the idea here is that you can compare a percentile mark between differently aged trees rather than just a metric value. So that's all great and uh, seems like a good idea, but how do you actually get those percentile ranges? How do you generate that data? And the way that we've chosen to do that is through a randomization based approach. And in this approach, we've created a model that randomly generates trees. So it's totally random. There's really no pressures that we've put on it or any additional stuff outside of randomization. And what we've done with that model is we've run it hundreds of thousands of times basically and collected data for all of those runs. So we have data for trees that are one generation old all the way through a thousand generations and for populations of different sizes, including 10, 100 and 1000 organisms per generation. So once we've run all of those trees, we have a bunch of data and we can sort through that data and say, you know, for this specific type of tree, let's say 100, organisms and it's 500 generations long. We can say, what are all the different values we have for those trees for phylogenetic diversity? And we say, what's the smallest, what's the biggest, and what's in between? And that's how we've gotten these percentile ranges. And the big idea here is that with enough data collection, once we run this so many times, you should produce a large range of possible tree permutations. And that should include the smallest and largest, or at least get close to those values and a representative sample of what lies in between. 
So we've done that and then we tested it basically with the same model and ran it. And what we would expect to see is the 50th percentile as on average with like data spanning, you know, the higher range of those values as well as the lower range. And we did see that for all of our different generational sizes, we found that on average, it classifies the phylogenetic diversity we're getting back in the 50th percentile for the same model. So our next step in that project was adding um, another type of model to test those percentile ranges with. So we created a model that has an extreme pressure for diversity. And we did this in the form of organism fitness, where rare genotypes were favored for reproduction, which in theory should cause the tree to branch more often and lead to higher diversity levels. And what we did find is exactly that. We found that our model or our normalization method would classify the phylogenetic diversity values for these trees in the 90th to 100th percentile and often in the 100th percentile. And this even told us, showed us some improvements that we'll need to make where, because a lot of this is in the 100th percentile, we need to flesh out the tail ends of those trees more. So that's really great. And we've shown a great um, concept there and there is more work to be done, but we did want to look at some other models of how to do this and see if we could find a better approach that would be a little bit more efficient or faster or more accurate. And so we've been exploring a few other options this summer. One of which is the uniform model, which is a new approach. And I've kind of represented it uh, here with these parentheses. So if you have three sets of parentheses, uh, what are all the different combinations that you can put them in basically? And it turns out that there are five different possible combinations you can put them in and they're shown here. The same sort of thing applies to uh, these phylogenies. If you have three different leaf nodes, how many different arrangements can you put them in and what are the diversity values for those trees? So we figured out a way to do that. We did all the math behind it and made the model and we tried to run it. And it was really great for a while. Uh, it seemed like it was producing meaningful data and it was accurate, but um, we ran into some serious computational limitations. Um, as soon as we got into anything more than a couple hundred leaf nodes in a tree basically. Uh, it was taking hours to run and we were lack, uh, lacking the precision that we needed to be able to actually calculate those things in a meaningful context. Uh, but even with that physical limitation, we wanted to see if the data we were getting from that model was actually applicable to, our, to the context we wanted to use it in. So we took our randomization based model and we took the trees that we were generating from that and tried normalizing them with the data we had uh, for the lower number of leaf nodes, but for this uniform model. And what we found is that this model was not necessarily reflective of actual evolution. A big part of this is because in the uniform model, you have to assume that all trees are equally likely to exist, which turns out isn't necessarily true. Um, as we see here, this is the data for that. Uh, older trees or older nodes in the tree are more likely to have died off over time. So this is a specific example of that where we generated a random tree and it had 148 leaf nodes and a phylogenetic diversity value of 218. Now, when we look at what the uniform model created for a tree with 148 leaf nodes, we can see that a lot of those phylogenetic diversity values are clustered down here around 190. Whereas what we were getting was 218. And normally you could say, oh, well, that's just a specifically high tree. But it turned out the way we were running this over and over again with different trees, we were always getting extremely high classification values. And we've had to rule that out as this is simply just not representative of actual evolution and the way that we've modeled evolution in this context. Uh, this is the log scale of the same graph for clarity, but yes. So we've ended up getting rid of this model and going back to the randomization based approach. So the other model that we're going to be looking at, but we haven't actually fleshed out yet is the U model. So this will be a future approach for us. But we have a few ideas of why it might be successful or why it might fail. Um, one of those things is that we don't focus on just bifurcating trees. We also have multiplications. And we can also add leaf nodes uh, to existing nodes, not just as necessarily uh, leaf nodes. So those are two things that the Yule model assumes that aren't true of our model. So it may not actually end up being a good, rep a good representation of what's happening but that is something that we'll do in the future. Uh, lastly, I wanted to talk about some future work that will happen with this project, uh, including the Yule model. Uh, 
experimentation. We also want to create some more types of trees to uh, test our percentiles with, fleshing out those tail ends of those distributions, as well as um, some of the mid ranges and seeing what kind of behavior produces, you know, 70th percentile or 30th percentile. What do those trees look like? Um, as well as including some other metrics outside of phylogenetic diversity. So those are the things that we're hoping to accomplish in the future. And that's all for my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. We actually have Thank good you. job on time. We actually have a good time for questions here. So if there's anybody who wants to pop in, I'll open the floor for that. Yeah, I had a question about uh, with the randomization, how are you generating your trees? Were you using like the avidian organisms um, or was there some other method of generating um, that kind of data? I used uh, Emily's uh, systematics manager in this project to keep track of trees. And so there weren't actually any like sort of complex organisms. An organism was basically just a, like, it just had like a value for its genotype and that would mutate randomly. Um, we used a mutation rate of 0 0.05. Um, for this project and we use the empirical random number generator. So it was very really, like a simple structure. There wasn't actually much more to it than that. But uh, does that answer your question? Great, any other questions? So I'll just uh, uh, sort of ask a, a practical future thing. So for Avita Ed, one of the things that we haven't put in, but that we have on our to-do list and would love to do would be something that would allow students to basically take the data that they generate in Avita Ed and then to recreate a phylogeny uh, and analyze it in that way. So can you think of ways in which what you've done might be usable or incorporated into that kind of a goal? Yes, um, that's actually really been the whole driving force behind this project in many ways is that this is useful in like a large scientific context in many ways, but especially in Avita Ed and with an empirical because this is like a specific digital evolution problem and you know we want people students to be able to look at what they're creating and compare it to other things, you know, look at their classmates uh, trees that they've created and um, actually take meaningful information away from that so that's sort of the whole goal here is to provide more meaningful uh, information about what a student is creating. And this also right. is going to be a part of empirical as a whole, so it will be useful in that sense. I think I'll invite Santiago to get his screen share and stuff set up, but I actually have one more question while we're transitioning, Abby. I'm curious, how long was the, the compute under the random model to, um, to um, generate uh, the data to do the normalization? And, and does that scale like linearly with the length of the evolutionary history? Uh, no, it, it definitely is an exponential growth situation. Trees that were really, really long with, you had a thousand organisms every generation for a thousand generations, those runs took like four days probably to get a data from. Because so we'd also run them a thousand times each or whatever. So it definitely I ended up being right. a long uh, data collection process, but yes. Great. Thank you for your uh, questions. Yeah, thanks for presenting, Abby. I'll hand the floor over to uh, Santiago, who uh, will take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthew. Um, let me know when to get started. Yeah, just go ahead. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Santiago Rodriguez Papa, uh, and I'm here with Matthew, Alex, and Charles to talk to you about Signal GP Lite. Um, Signal GP Lite is this event driven genetic programming library that uh, we designed with the idea of um, that, that it would assign for it to be used uh, in artificial uh, life applications, particularly uh, large scale simulations. Uh, to, to go a bit deeper into the backstory uh, behind this idea, uh, this all started with Dishni. Dishni is this artificial life framework uh, meant for the study of uh, transitions in individuality, in particular studying how unicellular organisms become multicellular organisms. Uh, this is a very memory and compute intensive um, simulation because it involves uh, keeping track of uh, hundreds of cells uh, 
and evolving their behavior uh, on every update. So the idea behind this was to use SignalGP uh, to control cell behavior. This is because uh, SignalGP, uh, the, the, the dynamic cell interactions needed uh, for this kind of simulation are actually very easily, um, very easily uh, processed by uh, the SignalGP backend. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the Avida style of cells where each cell uh, is a CPU. In this case, each individual, each multicellular individual consists of many CPUs. So in order to have a similar, um, a similar, uh, a similar number of individuals in a, in a world, you need many, many more CPUs. Uh, so you, you need a very robust and fast uh, framework to, to run all of this on. Here you can see a little um, graphical representation of what a sample dish in the world looks like. Each of the little squares is a cell, and each of the squares has four uh, cardinals that it interacts with its neighbors. Okay, so to go a bit deeper into why we were using SignalGP, uh, SignalGP is this, it's an event-driven genetic programming uh, framework. Uh, since it's event-driven, uh, it's, it's conceptually easier to develop and maintain for, in our case. Uh, moreover, one sec, it is also very fast, um, particularly in this case. And this kind of representation allows for more dynamic programs and more responsive programs, since the cells can more dynamically, um, since we can deal, uh, since the cells can be managed better, the dynamics behind the cells can be managed better. Uh, this Shini in particular requires lots of interactions between cells and amongst, uh, among cells and inside each cell, which uh, also is helped by the fact that single GP can handle this very easily. Um, suck there. To, an analogy. <laughs> uh, imagine uh, event driven. For those who don't know, event driven is uh, event driven is compared to procedural programming. In procedural programming, in the case of a tornado, you will be checking the window every every few minutes to see if there is a tornado. Whereas in an event driven framework, uh, you get an alert on your phone. So so yeah, it's basically you have these. Um, let me see. Oh yeah, you have these. Um, signals that trigger certain functions. Uh, I, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with single GP, but for those who are not, uh, here's the diagram um, from the original single GP paper. Um, this uh, this event driven paradigm actually um, involves little modules. In this case, there are these uh, little blocks that are, um, that are called depending on what this environment signal is. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if you can, uh, here, this envir uh, the environment uh, sent a signal out, and the signal best matched uh, the one the bottom right uh, module. It can be that a signal doesn't match any uh, any other tags, depending on what kind of metric you're using. But that that's that's another story. Um, okay. So, single GP was meant originally for program synthesis. Uh, this is this is a way. Uh, in which you can solve problems using genetic programming. Um, instead of going, naturally, when you're trying to solve a problem uh, in using an algorithm, uh, you would first, you know, you would first write out the, the, the program, try to understand the problem deeper, and then try to come up with a solution and then see how you can best uh, specify that solution in a set of instructions. In this case, however, you just have to define a fitness function and then just let the program run and let the simulation run. And eventually, hopefully, you'll get some kind of a solution. Um, the way single GP uh, facilitated this was using a call stack and also using control blocks. Uh, for example, like if for countdown, et cetera. Um, the original uh, single GP implementation was a proof of concept implementation. Uh, as such, it wasn't very highly optimized. It was not highly optimized and it was meant uh, for to kind of show off what the single GP idea could could do. Uh, now this left us wondering: okay, are all these program synthesis features really needed in artificial life application? Um, originally, when we were when when we were working Disney a couple of years ago, uh, we were having some problems when it came to resource usage. Um, Disney was consuming a lot of resources, and it wasn't. Uh, performing fast enough to our liking. You know, since we're, for example, in a, in a 10 by 10 world, we're trying to simulate hundred cells. And ideally we want a lot of updates to be able to see what's happening. You know, it makes no sense if an update takes a year and then you're basically just simulating 
real life at real life speed. You know, we want fast simulations. Uh, so we thought, hey, maybe we could remove these features, this, these program th synthesis features that we're not using to see if it makes things faster. And it kind of did, actually. So it spun off into its own library. Uh, enter SingleGP Lite. It's a simplified version of SingleGP meant for artificial life simulations. Uh, now, this leaves us wondering, is this really more efficient? Uh, in this talk, I'll be going over some benchmarks we run to compare the compute speed of single GP and single GP Lite. There's also single quality benchmarks that I won't be going into, but I can show off at the end if anyone has any questions. Okay, so execution speed benchmarks will be the ones we're looking at, and then solution quality, not covered, but it's fine. We, we, we covered it in the paper. Um, okay, so the kind of benchmarks we're doing are called micro benchmarks. This is what happened. Uh, this is a kind of benchmark where you you just measure uh, a particular set of instructions instead of a whole program, and you measure those over and over and over and over. The idea is that by profiling each of the individual instructions, you kind of get a representative idea of what a full program would perform like. Of course, these are all th synthetic benchmarks, which means that uh, it, they're man-made. It's not an actual. Well, they're all man-made, but these ones are specifically designed for the problem. They're not like, oh, we're running dishing and seeing how fast, it, if, how fast it performs. No, this is we're running instructions and seeing how well they perform in that particular case. Ideally, that reflects your overall performance. So, analogy for a micro benchmark. Imagine a racetrack, and the racetrack has randomly generated instructions in it. In this case, this racetrack is full of knobs. Uh, then you have your little runner CPU uh, that's going around the racetrack, and we basically just measure how fast it does each loop. Um, we do this over and over and over, and they take the average, and then you have your, your idea of how fast the CPU can do this. So here are the, the, some of the results in execution speed benchmarks that we run. Um, here's the, the initial graph. Uh, on the bottom axis, on the x-axis, you'll see the number of agents. Uh, this number of agents, it's basically the number uh, the population size that we've run these benchmarks with. On the y-axis, you'll see the wall, sp wall time speed up. This is a unitless measurement. Basically, it is single GP lights results divided by single GP results. So if you see a number greater than one here, it means single GP light was faster. If you see a number less than one, uh, it means that single GP was faster. As you can see by the scale, uh, at, you know, there's, no, there's no numbers for less than one in this case. Uh, let's, so, okay, before that, uh, we run a control uh, benchmark. The way we did this was basically we imported both libraries, we imported our Google benchmarking library, and then we run an empty loop. Uh, the reason behind this was to make sure that our benchmarking framework was unbiased. You know, had we had better results for one of the two libraries here, that would have been kind of weird, you know, because we're just importing the libraries. We're not really doing much. Um, so it is good news that they were all near one in this case. Uh, next benchmark was the knob benchmark. Uh, in this case, we just run a, a program of, that consisted of 100 knob instructions over and over and um, just timed that. Uh, the idea behind this was to benchmark uh, whether the, the call stack, sorry, where the micro interpreter of single GP light uh, was better or worse than single GP lights, than single GP's lambda based instructions. So in single GP light, we have basically functors and a switch statement to call each of the each of the operations. And in single GP light, we just have a bunch of lambda, a bunch of lambdas just being called. As you can see, uh, single GP light was faster than single GP in this case. Uh, we observed an eight times to thirty times speed up, and the highest speed up was at one hundred twenty four agents. On the left. You can see a sample program <laughs> of just knobs. <laughs> it's kind of boring. Next benchmark, um, arithmetic. Here, uh, instead of doing knobs, we just did arithmetic instructions. In this case, it's just add, subtract, divide, and multiply. Uh, this was to test how the fixed size registers of single GP light compared to single GP's vector registers. Uh, th this trade off is basically trading off runtime uh, configurability for speed. Instead of being able to change the SARA registers, we just always have a fixed size of three, no, of eight. Um, 
and then we just deal we just deal with that the whole time. As you can see, this was faster also in single GP Lite's case with a between 20 times to 50 times speed up. The faster speed up was once again at 124 agents. Uh, next, we have a complete benchmark. This is just all the instructions present in single GP and single GP Lite. Uh, this was to measure whether uh, having inner loops be just jump instructions in single GB Lite's case was faster, and it was. Uh, we observed a 30 times to over 50 times speed up, and the greatest speed up was seen at 32 agents. We also run another benchmark that you can probably see from the from the legend that I'm not going to show off here, uh, which is basically control minus regulation. I can go a bit deeper into that um, at the end if you want. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, single GB Lite is written for general purpose use. Uh, it is the first single GB implementation written for the general public. As such, it is available on GitHub under an MIT license. It is extensible and highly configurable. Um, it also has public docs, unit tests, and benchmarks in order to be able to use by anyone. And then all of these results that I presented here are in preparation for our Journal of Open Source Software publication. Uh, the pre-publication is available on archive. I'll link it at the end. Uh, further benchmarks. We're gonna we're gonna also uh, do a further benchmark at the end, uh, which is a Boolean calculator uh, to profile arithmetic operations and registers. Um, basically, consists of uh, of of a bunch of like operations and trying to get the programs to basically just become a calculator. Uh, and if you needed any more proof that single GP Lite is faster than single GP, here we have Alex, uh, the original developer of single GP. <laughs> <laughs> saying that the <laughs> CLGP Lite implementation is better than CLGP. I didn't make this, by the way. <laughs> and yeah, some acknowledgments, of course, Matthew for developing CLGP Lite, uh, Alex for developing the original CLGP implementation, Charles for uh, being uh, RPI and helping with all this. Uh, okay, oh, uh, NSF grants? I don't, I don't think I have enough time. Uh, NSF grants and... Um, yeah, we, we're some by NSF, and also by ICER, we'll learn all the benchmarks. And then here are the references. Uh, I can come back to this if you want. And then does anyone have any questions? Here's the pre-publication, repo, and docs. And yeah. Great, we've got about a minute for questions. <laughs> Thank you for the talk, that was great. Yeah, but it, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I spoke so fast, go ahead. Can you jump back to the, the comparison? Uh, yeah, slide? totally. Uh, give me one sec. Let me make sure I didn't click out. And mostly what was, so, okay. The, the this one? one? So um, the, for the complete set, uh, I mean, and I mean, it seems odd for it to go as the number of agents increases for it to go up, then down, then up again. So how much data were you, how many runs did you analyze this based off of? Uh, I pre uh, we did so I think we did a hundred thousand no wait hang on um I think it was a thousand uh, replicates wasn't it I think so, it was uh, I think it was like 20, 10 or twenty replicates but under the hood Google benchmark um, does runs more. runs sure. these like its little snapshot timings thousands of times yeah yeah let, let so me it, ask the question then in terms of you know, do you have any in instinct of why going from one to 32 goes up, then another 32 fold, it goes down, another 32 fold, it comes up again? Uh, so I, I, I'm, I would say it has more to do with, um, with limitations in where, like in the computer, we run these benchmarks on more than anything else. And uh, it has, I would argue it has more to do with resource allocation problems uh, particularly when it comes to the size of the benchmarks, you know, uh, 32,000 agents is a lot in this case. So we do expect a certain drop off there. As okay. to why the arithmetic benchmark uh, was faster at a higher number of agents than the complete benchmark, um, I don't think we we looked into that because moreover the benchmarks were were performed at different times. So it was faster uh, at 1,024 and then right. not as fast at 32. Anyway, so uh, the idea, the idea I of this, think we're going to have to this... type off here. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. So we, basically we, we should talk about the stats later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well. okay. And I think Great. someone's had a question, but I'll answer it later on um, Slack. Sorry. No, you're fine. All right. 
Um, let's go ahead and move to our uh, next presenter. Um, let me bring up my list here and see who that is. It's Aria. Oh, uh, Aria, perfect. All right, if you want to go ahead and take it away. Um, thanks, Aria. Hello. Okay, it loads. Okay, um, today we are going to be talking about the future of MADE 2 and in particular what we did this summer in terms of documenting and testing this software. Um, I'm Arya Kilabu Brule. I'm a rising junior at Reed College, majoring in computer science and minoring in French. And my name is Linnea Rohan. I'm an undergraduate at Grinnell College studying computer science, Chinese, and linguistics. This summer, Ari and I were lucky enough to be participants in the WAVES program, uh, which was conducted through Michigan State University's Digital Evolution Lab. So what is MAEB2? MAEB stands for Modular Agent Based Evolver, and this is the second version of that software. MAEB was first uh, designed in 2017 by Clifford Baum, Arid Hintza, and Jory Sasho to facilitate more modular and reproducible experiments for the study of evolutionary computation in artificial life. It has since been used in numerous papers as a platform for results about topics such as cognition, information slow, flow, and sexual selection. The complete overhaul of this software, MAPE 2.0, began in 2019. MAPE 2 has been built using the empirical library, which you heard about earlier. Um, use of the empirical library will allow for MAPE 2 to be put on the web in the future. Finally, the modular design of MAPE 2, which Linnea will touch on later, will be an essential part of the Avita 5 software. So why should you use MAPE2? Well, MAPE2 is a software used to study evolution. In the real world, the process of evolution can take millions or billions of years, meaning it's impossible to observe in one lifetime. With digital evolution software, you can run experiments about evolution or artificial life in a matter of seconds. But if you were to sit down and write all of this software from scratch, that would take a really long time as well. With MAPE 2, the software has already been built and it has an insightful design that allows for these experiments to be written with ease. As Aria said, MAPE 2 is the perfect blend between structure and flexibility. Its goal is to provide a convenient and fast way to plan, build, and run evolutionary experiments. In its name, MAPE 2 is modular, meaning it's built from different models that can be connected to create custom experiments. That means it's really easy for end users. You just decide what modules you want, plug them into the MAPE 2 framework, and off you go. Modules in MAVE 2 contain the aspects of an experiment that cannot be held constant. As I said, experiments are created by combining different modules together. The modules themselves are customizable and are easy to create from scratch if the provided ones don't suit your needs. As long as they follow the module interface, there should be no issues when running experiments with your own modules. In MAVE 2, there are seven categories of modules. Organism modules, evaluator modules, selector modules, placement modules, analysis modules, interface modules, and schema modules. For example, in the organism module category, you have modules that represent organisms. Organisms are the individual agents and the target of evolution in MAPE 2. Now we'll talk a little bit about the documentation process. So say you wanted to start writing and running MAPE 2 experiments of your own. Where would you start? How do you understand a huge software package that you have no familiarity with? This was the obstacle that Linnea and I ran into in our first week of waves. We began by slowly working through the design of MAPE2 with our mentors, and we spent lots of time looking through comments in the source code. We also coded our own modules from scratch with guidance from our mentors, and throughout the entire summer, we asked lots and lots of questions. But what if you don't have time to do all of that? If only there was some well-organized and easily accessible place where you could learn how to install MAPE2, look at a quick start guide to understand how to run an experiment, and find guides for the library of MAPE2 modules. That would be kind of like a paradise, right? Well, good news. MAPE 2's documentation is now live. However, slight disclaimer, since MAPE 2 is still in active development, there are parts of the documentation that are missing or subject to change in the future. We were able to document a good chunk of MAPE 2, as you can see here. However, as I mentioned previously, we weren't able to document everything. The main components that were left out were genomes and brains, which were an essential part of the main one software. Genomes are sources of heritable and mutable data. Brains are data processors that receive input and deliver output. The implementation of these elements has yet to be finalized in MAPE 2, so we kept it out of the documentation. We also did not include documentation of dynamic orgs, which were implemented by WAVES participants, Jamie Sch Schmidt and Mitchell Johnson. You can learn all about that by looking at their poster. So Ari and I came into the summer with two big goals. 
The first one was making MAPE too usable to a wide audience. That's where the documentation came in. And the second was making MAPE too easy to maintain over time, which where the testing came in. But why bother testing MAPE too? Well, it's already on its way to being a largest piece of software, and it's ex it's only expected to get bigger. As MAPE2 goes live, we are already planning on and hoping to expand the module libraries as users create their own custom modules and submit them to be added to the MAPE2 framework. However, the issue that arises is that big software becomes both unwieldy to use and difficult to maintain. We also need to make sure that new additions don't bring any unexpected issues or bugs. So how do you start testing it? Well, when you're working with projects with lots of dependencies, it is important to start testing with the files that have the least amount of dependencies. If that didn't really make any sense, that's fine. It's a bunch of coding jargon. Instead, let me give you a biology example. I do want to point out that I'm not a biologist, so if there are any details that are wrong, just ignore them for the purpose of the example. Well, let's pretend we are a whale researcher. We know that the whales have a really simple food chain. They depend on eating krill, and the krill depend on eating plankton. As a researcher, we notice that there's something going wrong in the whale population. It's decreasing unexpectedly. So we'll start looking at possible sources of change. What's in the whale's habitat? Is there any whale hunting going on? However, the issue very well could be with the krill population. Um, if the krill population is declining, that could definitely cause the whale population to decline. However, the, the issue also could be in the plankton population. If that declines, the krill population will decline and then the whale population is declining. Files and dependencies in software work the same way. There are files that, like the plankton, don't depend on anything else. There are also files that are like the whales. They depend upon other files that may have dependencies of their own. For the whales, their list of dependencies is short. They depend on krill and plankton. Software dependencies can be much more complex. However, unlike with complex food chains, complex dependency networks can be much simpler to test. Just start with the files that either don't have any dependencies or that have the least number of dependencies. Then work your way up the dependency network. This allows you to be sure any issues you run into are from the file you're working on and not something the file depends on. This is a bottom up approach to testing and mapping the dependency relationships between files is called levelization. On the screen, you can visualization of the levelization of just one folder in MAPE2. Already, this is kind of complicated. Multiply that by multiple big folders in MAPE2 and you're looking at a crazy amount of dependencies. So in MAPE2, the folder containing the least number of dependencies is called source. The source folder contains a bunch of code for the implementation of MAPE2 and includes both the core and config file folders. That's a picture of the source um, dependency network was on the previous slide. These are the two folders that Ari and I worked on this summer for testing to make sure that they were working correctly. The core folder contains all of the code for MAPE to run and includes a basic implementation for modules as well as MAPE2's error manager, which handles errors and error messages. We also tested almost all of the config file. Like the name suggests, this folder manages all the configuration of MAPE runs and includes the parser implementation. Although we weren't able to test all of MAPE2, we got a lot done this summer. To be exact, this summer we wrote 3,962 lines of code and 1,045 test cases. So Ari and I came into this project not only interested in learning about how to write tests, but also about the entire process of writing and testing code. Our mentors were able to come up with a good routine so that we could try out every part of the testing process. First, we would look over the file ourselves, again with our mentors to make sure we knew what was going on. Then we would implement as many test cases as we could think of. We would pass that test file over to our mentors and we would compare with a list that they had come up with, um, a, a list of test cases that they had come up with. If we were missing any, we'd go back and implement our own. We'd just repeat that over and over. We change our own file, we'd compare it to our mentors list, we'd change our own file, compare it to our mentors list. And then when everyone was happy with the code coverage, we went on to a new file. Now we'll show you a quick example of customizing and running a MAPE2 experiment. To keep this example simple, we'll just talk about using an evaluator module to determine the fitness of a BITS organism. A BITS organism is just a series of BITS. You could evaluate its fitness based off of the number of correctly packed bits it displays, bricks it displays. A brick is just a series of exactly n ones, and it is packed on either side by at least k zeros. So if n was three and k was one, this example organism would have a fitness of three. To run your experiment, first you'd create the .gen file. You would then either by uh, copying and modifying an existing file or by writing one from scratch. You would then use the .gen file to create the .mape file, which you would modify to customize your experiment as desired. 
Then all that's left to do is run your project and view and save your data. So as Ari said, the first step to running a MAVE experience experiment is to create a .gen file. On the right, you can see a screenshot of the one we made for our example packing problem. This is where you'll decide on which modules you want to use in your experiment. We chose a packing evaluator, which is in that red line on line 6, and a bits organism, which is in the red box on line 12, along with some other modules to get us running. From your .gen file, you then create your .mave file, which you can see a snippet of on the next slide. Um, the the .mave file is the main MAVE2 interface for now. As Charles said previously, it's hoping we're hoping that MAVE2 will um, at some point go on, web, on the web, but for now, we're using a text-based interface. So in the .mave file, modules expand into chunks of more detailed information. Inside each module chunk, you can see a bunch of variables that are related to the contents of the module. This is where you do any fine tuning you want for your experiment. For our example, if you wanted to change the brick size, or um, the number of zeros padding each side of the brick, this is where you would do so. As you can see, like um, in the .gen file on line six was our packing evaluator that expands from line 10 to 15 in the .mave file, giving you access to different variables to modify this module. So once you're satisfied with your .mave file, you're ready to run your experiment. Just navigate to your terminal and make sure you're in the right directory before running your .mave file. On screen, you can see a real-time run of our packing experiment. Once the run is finished, you may see some summary data at the bottom. So you can see the data from your experiment in the output.csv file located inside of the MAPE2 folder. We've included an example output file on the slide. What is stored in the output file is also customizable within the file output module. And that's it, you've run a MAPE2 experiment customizable, easy to set up, and fast to run. We both had such a great time this summer and learned so much. We'd like to give a huge thank, uh, shout out to our mentors, Acacia Eccles and Austin Ferguson, also to Charles Afria and Clifford Bum for their additional MAVE2 support. We also want to give a huge shout out to all of the WAVE's mentors and participants, as well as Michigan State University, and acknowledge the active lens learning evolution of science using evolution in action, a uh, grant that allowed us this amazing internship opportunity. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. We've got time for questions from the audience, so I'll go ahead and open it up. I guess while, while people are thinking of uh, questions, I can start off with one, which was, um, uh, what was the, the, um, like the, the most challenging part of, um, of uh, the work that you did this summer? I'm, I'm curious uh, what, what in particular you think would be like the, the biggest hurdle potentially for new people coming into MABE that we might want to continue to work on um, kind of reducing as a barrier to people being able to, to, to get up and running? The biggest challenge for me was just the first couple of um, weeks trying to onboard this project, just because there was no MAPE2 documentation. So there was nowhere where we could look to, to learn how to install it, to learn how things um, worked out. So that really was a challenge having, for me, having never worked with software like this before, um, trying to figure it out. So for both of us that just really made us appreciate like okay good documentation is really important and uh is very valuable um and makes everybody's life a lot easier so just keeping up with that um for the future yeah i think that's i'm going to echo a lot of what aria said now that we have some documentation up about how to get mave 2 up and running on your own device that's going to be a, really helpful for people coming in um I think maybe the thing that would be, well, I mean, MAVE2 has two different like sets or groups of people that are going to be using it. There's people who are just using it for the work it can give them or do for them. And then there are the people who want to work with it and also contribute to it. So that might, making sure that we are, or making sure that there's enough support for both groups of people is going to be the next 
hurdle in, as far as documentation goes for whoever comes after us. Great, thank you. Um, we were a little bit late getting you started, uh, but I think we're just about at 15 minutes. So um, I will go ahead and um, hand the floor over to Tate to give the final presentation of the, the session here. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, and I'll, I'll hand the floor over to Tate to get started. Hello, I'm Tate. Can everyone hear me? Cool. Uh, so I'm uh, going into my second year as a grad student at UC Davis. And I'm going to be talking about how to move your scientific computing into the browser today. So what this is about is mostly what I've been doing this summer, but I know you're not just coming to a talk to listen to that. So hopefully you'll be coming away with all the reasons why you should use Empirical's web framework. So yeah, specifically, this is going to be about Empirical's prefab components, which as opposed to the web components are compositions of basic components that are designed to quickly get you started um, with some nice uh, web development features. Uh, and in general, this is going to be a little demo of converting a command line tool to a web application. Uh, so I just wrote a little C++ program. And since I like random walks, I'm just doing a little random walk with uh, a random walker starting at the origin. And I've made a little function take step that will randomly take a step in either the cardinal directions or optionally along the diagonal with equal probability. And so this is just really simple to do if you were doing a command line tool, but I want to share it with a colleague. And they're on a different operating system. That's a problem. Uh, they also don't have time to install the dependencies. They're very busy. And they prefer to use the tablet. And they only have their phone on them right now. At this point, they're probably making excuses. But the point here is that these are a lot of barriers to um, outreach. If you want to get your code out to people and your research results out to people, it's very likely that this is going to apply to a number of different people, um, one or more of these conditions. Uh, so what we're going to do is add Empirical to the project and compile with EM Scripten. This will turn it into a web application. Or technically, this will allow it to run on the web, but there's a lot more to um, a web application than just running on the web. Okay, uh, so Charles already demoed a bit of this, so we're going to go through. A simple thing that we can do is we can add an empirical document, uh, and here I'm calling it space, and then I'm going to go rather quickly through this. So this is where all the components live that we generate in our C++ code. And so right here, I've got my little demo, and here's the HTML. Uh, you've seen this before, there's a lot of things to import to make sure that things run correctly, but the core of it is that we've got a div with the ID EMP base, and this is where um, our document object attaches. Uh, so next, I'd really like to be able to run code for my application, and so here we've got a web button, and this is going to take a step. It runs take step button uh, on our random walker. And so I can click that and it's running code. I hope you trust me. But if you don't, let's just show how you can actually see what's going on. Uh, so if we pulled in a div, uh, what I'm going to do is I have a button now that will redraw uh, the state of the random walker. And I wrap this in a live component. And now you're able to see if I click take a step and I say, show me, then it's going to show where the random walker is x, y coordinates. So that's nice. Um, but you can think this is pretty tedious. I mean, this doesn't look very nice. How are you going to deal with that? Well, if you've got a lot of objects, we've actually created a solution for this. Um, so this here is the readout panel. And it's based off an existing prefab component, a card component, which is styled nicely. And you can toggle its toggle its open or closed state. I named this stat. Um, it takes in triples, 
where you have two strings, the name of the value, a description of the value, and the value itself. And what it does is it can actually, it wraps these in live variables, but essentially this is no, uh, or hands-free at managing the animation and kind of continually pulling these values. In this case, I'm pulling this about every, uh, or four times a second uh, at 250 milliseconds. Um, and so here's the example in the demo, the card component opens and closes, got the position. And now when I click step, you can see the position and distance are updating in real time. And so that's a real quick way that you can get your live variables put into an application. Um, if you had statistics that you wanted to read out, this is a great option. But there's a lot of cool other visualization tools uh, if you really want to get down to it and make fantastic visualizations. Um, but this is kind of the bare minimum, and it's super easy if you want to take your command line tool and uh, change it to a web application. So now the other ingredient that we'd need if we're trying to do this is we need some way to control values in the simulation. And oftentimes what we want is settings. So for example, this Boolean here, whether or not the random walker can walk along the diagonals, it would be really nice to control this inside the application. So what I can do is use Empirical's configuration system. And I create a config file. And then I reference this config file uh, when I take a step and I check whether I am allowing diagonals. Down here, what I'm gonna do is I create a prefabricated config panel. And this is a really nice class. Uh, it creates a bunch of cards that hold all the settings you might need uh, for numeric settings. It even creates range sliders and tries to intelligently set them so that they're, the next highest magnitude of 10 is kind of their upper bound. It'll make it symmetric if you plug in a negative number to initialize, uh, but you can also override it using that range function. And so I'll show you that list here. So now we have random walk settings um, and simulation settings. I named my random walker alpha. That was incredibly important for future generations. Um, we've got it, we can control the feed here. So this will initialize SRAM and I can use this reload button to restart the simulation. So now if I take steps, I can allow diagonal. And occasionally you might see that both values here update at the same time because it's stepping along a diagonal. So this is a really simple way of managing your settings and the reload function allows you to inject kind of your parameters into a URL. And if this is going live, which my application is, you could copy this URL and share it with someone, which would share all the configuration for your simulation. So there's a whole bunch more components, but this is about all I'm able to share right now. Oh yeah, so there's a nice restart button. Um, so one, something else I'd like to share, and this kind of answers Jay's question from earlier, we actually have a nice way of starting out. There is something called the Cookie Cutter Empirical Project, um, and it's a template that you can use to stamp out something with all the setup. It even has uh, Git actions to uh, auto-deploy your page, which is what I used here. Um, and it comes with an example of the configuration system if you want to create applications with that. So that's a really great way to get started. So I'd like to thank Matthew, who is my mentor for this project, and uh, also just leading this entire program, and he's done a fantastic job, and the National Science Foundation for supporting this work. Thank you all for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Great, thank you for the talk. Uh, yeah, we have actually got a good amount of time for questions. Um, so I'll go ahead and open the floor up. So I, oh, I, see what it, I feel it's on the chat. Uh, so what other prefabs are currently being planned? Well, let me tell you, there's like a whole lot on the, on the list. Uh, I think one of the coolest things is a graph manager. Um, Dave Ackley has been working on kind of a D3 wrapper, which will allow you to make really beautiful graphs. Um, and the idea is, or one of the plans is hopefully to make something that will manage all these graphs. 
Um, so that would be very cool. Um, let's see what else we got. Currently there's a control panel that's in, in development, which would just create a little start stop button um, and a step button. Uh, so that would be really nice to add simulations and be kind of like a, a good standard to be able to create. Great, I think Charles had a question, um, I heard. No, I, I was actually um, pointing out the one in chat. Oh, okay, but, perfect. I mean, all this stuff is just so fantastic. I am, yeah, delighted by it. And, and since I have a bit of uh, extra time, I'm gonna, well, there's some resources here and I can drop the links. Uh, these slides are actually live served from GitHub and so is the demo. Uh, I'll just go this behind the scenes. So how I actually built this, um, if you look down here, there is some hidden stuff right here. These presentation controls are actually what's showing these pieces here. So I used the config panel and some of the work I did with uh, HTML query strings to make this possible. That's so wait, did you put the, so did you use something external to build the slides or is, did you build all of this? No, so I am using um, reveal JS. Uh, okay, and then you hooked so, all, all the JS apps into the reveal. Got it. Yes. Yeah, this I have to start doing this because being a the, the I have to say throughout your talk that the live sort of interaction is just spectacular to have. Yeah, it's it's pretty fun. So uh, I could actually show you. Uh, this just shows that the reload works now. Um, if I do hide stuff and I reload this page, let's see. Oh, yeah. So the step button is now gone. Um, I could hide the config, but that would be bad because then I wouldn't be able to get to these controls. <laughs> but this just shows that uh, you uh, that you can control the the settings live, um, and that's how I reveal things slowly. That's really awesome. I think we've got time for one more question if anybody has one. Oh yeah, and then there's link here. All the prefab components have little demos right here. So let me post some of these in chat if anyone's interested. I think that would be a to... great place to, to get an overview of the different prefab components is that demo page. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to poking around with some of this. Direct Great. All right, then I think we're coming up on the end of the session here. I want to thank all of our presenters, first and foremost. Uh, you all did a, a great job. I really enjoyed all the presentations. I want to um, uh, thank the audience for your time and your attention. And um, I just want to give what, just one more shout out. Thank you to the Waves, the Waves Workshop in general. Working with you all this summer has been really great. Um, I look forward to seeing you all around. Woohoo! All right. Well done, everyone. <laughs>